Hello and welcome to Daily Politics on Trust TV. On this program, we discuss issues around politics, policy and governance. I am Hamza Idris. Political actors are currently working on various templates to activate their strategies in order to navigate the volatile and uncertain political atmosphere in the country ahead of the 2027 elections. While some are quick to engage in realignment of political forces through alliances and merger talks, others are working hard to consolidate their grip on power in the face of uncertainties arising from their seeming failure to deliver on the current mandate. Some political pundits are already attributing the inter-party wranglings rocking the major opposition political parties struggle to hold on to structures between erstwhile political allies in states like Rivers, Kano and Kaduna with huge voting population, in addition to the royal rumble in Kano, among others behind the scenes came into the 2027 permutations. It is against this backdrop we will be engaging with a non-strategist, policy analyst, and the group CEO of global investment and trade company, Malam Baba Yusuf, to X-ray the 2027 political calculations and their potencies or otherwise. Welcome to the program, Baba. Thank you for having me. We're happy Hamza. having you. It's good to be Became here. your royal regalia. <laughs> <laughs> but before the conversation, here are some tidbits. A federal high court in Kano on Thursday notified the reinstatement of Muhammad Sanusi as the 16th Emir of Kano. The court also notified all the actions taken after the reinstatement of Emir Sanusi. The presiding judge, Justice Abdullah Liman, ordered that every step taken by the government has been nullified and becomes null and void. Justice Liman said he listened to the audio of the governor, both in Hausa and English, after assenting to the law and that he was convinced that the respondents are aware of the order of maintaining status quo pending the hearing and determination of the motions on notice in the court. He said the situation, which he described as catastrophic, could have been averted if the respondents followed due process by complying with the court order, which will still have allowed them to carry out their assignments. He noted that the respondents, however, decided to act according to their whims and caprices, a situation which he said landed them in a serious mess. And elsewhere in River State, Governor Similai Fubara has said the newly sworn in caretaker committee chairman in the state can operate from anywhere if attempts to gain access to council secretariats will breach the peace in the state. Governor Fubara stated this shortly after swearing in the Twitter local government chairman at the government house in Patakot on Wednesday. He warned the caretaker chairman not to confront the security men who have taken over the council secretariat, saying he does not want to be associated with violence. He said the most important thing was that the caretaker chairman are now in charge of the local government areas. Governor Fubara also noted that the tenure of the caretaker committee will be short-lived because in the coming days, the River State Independent Electoral Commission will begin the process for the conduct of local government election. The police command in the state had on Tuesday announced that it had taken over all the local government council headquarters to forestall further bloodshed and to prevent the breakdown of law and order. I recall that a policeman and a member of a local security outfit were killed during a clash between supporters of the governor and his predecessor, the Federal Capital Territory Minister Nwesewiki, at a very local government area of the state. We will now take a short break. When we return, the conversation commences. Stay with us. Welcome back. Yes, Malam Baba, welcome to the studio once again. And uh, coincidentally, you are from Kano. Yes. Maybe you are a royal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Hamza. Yes. It's um, good to be here. Yes. Uh, was it expected, the judgment by Justice Liman today? If you ask me personally, yes. I expected this outcome from the uh, Federal High Court. Uh, we anticipate this moves and counter moves. Uh, just recall that uh, already, you know, as usual, it is becoming a norm now. The judiciary has become, you know, a very interesting uh, institution in the past uh, couple of months with uh, moves and counter moves within the same institution. Let us not forget there is already a suit 
pending in front of the Kano State High Court, instituted by you know the other parties, Kano State Government and the Kano State Legislature, if you like, that is the faction of uh, His Highness uh, Emir Muhammad Sunusi II. So uh, I will say the litigation rigmaroling will continue. Uh, there is already a subsisting order by the Federal High Court. With due respect to that court, it has been decided today. But I don't think it is the end of it, even if it is that leg that is, you know, ongoing. We know the highest court of the land is Supreme Court. I guess as much as possible that the next card of play for the government of Kano State uh, uh, is to say they are going to appeal that matter. And to, they would have quickly, quickly, you know, applied for a stay of execution, which is what I will do if I'm on their part as a lawyer. It's commonsensical. You quickly apply for stay while the matter, you know, goes to appeal. And then from appeal, it goes to Supreme Court. That is on one side of it. And then let us also not forget the matter is before the Kano State High Court. Why did I say I expected it? Because the dramatic personae, if you like, in the matter, in this case, uh, uh, His Highness uh, Aliu Babata uh, Agunti, uh, you know, he works, you know, he's on the side of uh, the five Emirates. Uh, so it is very obvious. And, and how the matter came and how that uh, ex parte came about at that time with all the controversies that the judge gave the ex parte while he was not in the country, blah, blah, blah. So it is easy to see these days to preempt the courts without, with due respect to them without wanting to be subjudices, but they have created a predictability in judiciary such that we can almost hazard a guess where a judge is leaning to, which is very unfortunate. It shouldn't be so. If I recall, it was around Thursday in the evening or thereabout, I may be wrong, when Babada Agunti secured that uh, judgment. Then yes. on Friday yes. in the morning, mm -hmm. yeah, if I'm right, uh, that was when the state assembly, you know, they assented to all that. And then in the evening, the, the governor spoke. Some analysts, if you follow the social media, they are saying uh, the, the judge large on the speech by the governor. Yes. To indict the governor. Yes, yes. Said the governor ought to have been very smart. Yes. Not even make reference yes. to whatever yes. happened. But yes. he said that uh, the the judgment was procured yes. from London or yes. from yes. America yes. or whatever. Yes. And then the governor now, he descended on the governor, I mean, or, yeah, the judge descended on the governor, the canon said government, that they were fully aware, even if it was at night, that he has given an order. But they now went all out to violate his order. Who is right here? Well, I wouldn't want to say who is right, but in my objective assessment of it is, yes, uh, his lordship, you know, may be right to say they have heard based on the evidence, you know, in front of him. But then I, I, I most likely the, the, the governor of Kano and his team may say they were supposed to wait until they were properly served, if you understand what I mean, to be served properly. Hearing that something is going to happen or an action has been taken, in the eyes of the law could be different from when I'm properly served, you know, in the eyes of the law. If I'm properly served, then I'm, I'm, I'm bound by that, you know, to comply. What I don't know, because I'm not in that group, is whether they were served. And it is based on that service that His Excellency Governor Abu Kabir Yusuf was making those statements. But the days ahead will unravel the reality. But like I said, again, we have two concurrent matters before courts that have concurrent uh, rankings mm -hmm. in the circuit of courts in Nigeria. And uh, so some, some people also, uh, including uh, people like Femi Falana, SAN, are saying that um, there are issues of pre uh, jurisdiction, which was also raised by, in this case, the deponents, and that is uh, His Excellency, the governor, government of Kano State, let mm -hmm. me use that, to say that um, the Federal High Court does not have jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, His Lordship has assumed jurisdiction, and he has proceeded you know, to give a ruling, which should be bounding on everybody. And if you look at it critically, uh, smartly, let me put it this way, but Bada Agundi, you know, he only said his fundamental human rights. Absolutely. Which the Federal High Court has jurisdiction Absolutely. To, to entertain. Absolutely. What remains to be seen is the meat of the case, Hamza. The meat of the apart case from now. The technicalities. Is, apart from the technicalities. Technicalities, brilliant move by Bada Agundi. The, the strategy was to stall the process. Dis disrupt the process so that they will have an opportunity, if you like, to be fully back on the bus because it appears they were half out of the bus and then from the other. But how they have been able to build the case going forward is very critical because we apply the concept of front loading. 
and as you are proceeding, if you're, you didn't do your homework ab initio, to be able to capture the entire premise within which you want to go back and capture the throne, and you only use one leg, which I don't know because I'm not private to the details, mm. then you may have issues at appeal. That being said, like I said, we'll wait to see what will unravel. But personally, in my opinion, this is highly uncalled for. This is not what we want to see in the throne of Kano. This is not what we want to see in the state and city of Kano, over 1,000 years, you know, throne of Kano, one of the most advanced, you know, uh, entities in, in, in Sahel. You know, now we are reduced to this situation where we are running and trying to pick our nose, while other entities like Lagos are moving on building airports and becoming large economies in the continent. And I am happy you, you have opened the, the, the window to discuss this. And I think uh, we have every liberty because judgment has been passed. So it's not sub judice to get Yes, somebody, yeah, somebody to, may say to, the, yes. the state high court is there, but we will so, circumnavigate it yes, and have our conversation yes, and I think we'll without breaching the law. The justices we will and not the lawyers, the law. we are talking about the political Angle. aspect yeah. of this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why we said we're examining the early political calculations, yeah, uh, which is the, our subject of this. Case. I want to, us to go back a little. Looking at the way Sanusi was the throne. Yes. Years back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, reinstated. Mm. And should I use the word that the throne today? Yes. Again, uh, wouldn't that be a precedence for, you know, that will actually affect the traditional institution in the north? Not necessarily Kano. To be honest, um, I wrote in my piece, which will come out, I wrote a, you know, an op-ed in my column with regards to what I call the seeming diminution, you know, value of our traditional institutions, Hamza. And it's not just about Kano or North. And I said even in other forums that other traditional rulers should wake up to this reality and sit down, and as citizens also to sit down and say, is this how we will allow our traditional institutions to be balkanized and bastardized and then completely decimated? Because our politicians are taking the game to the next level. What do I mean? Uh, students of politics, history, and strategy know that issues of deposition or removal of uh, kings and rulers is not new in our land and it's not new globally. Uh, in Nigeria, I can put it in context to say it started rearing its heads more you know, from the 1840s, you know, apart from the, what I call the, what is similar to what is happening now in Kano. Most of the time before the intervention of colonial masters and the in, you know, interference of political class, back in the days, what you have is intertribal wars, intercommunal wars, where you know, a king is taken out during war. Either he's killed or he's captured and enslaved. Or in the case of Kano, we saw many times we hear the Yike and Basasa. Basasa means the civil war within the royal house of Kano. You know, because it has been an advanced house. And when there's power, there's tussle Hamza. The house of Saud and Saud of Fad in Saudi Arabia. We've seen power tussles in the house of royal house of England. But in this case, economic merchants came in the form of colonial masters and started this game of removal and all that. Of course, because the kings at that time or the Obas we are confronting them or the obese and fighting them. And of course, when they lose, they take them out. But then fast forward to the 1845s, where the Oba Akitoyes of Lagos, there was, that, that was an internal fight between him and Kosoko, mm -hmm. his cousin. And uh, later on, he was removed. And the Oba of Oranwem of uh, Bini Kingdom and the likes of uh, King Jaja of Opobo. If you come up north, you know, around that time also, was the time that uh, Serki Alume Sango, uh, the great grandfather or grand uncle of the current governor of Kano State. Interestingly, many people don't know that Abu Kabir Yusuf, His Excellency, is actually fully royal blood. You mean you know, he can fan, also vie for him? Absolutely, because um, his great grandfather was a, was 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 uh, Galadiman Kano uh, Yusuf Majegarko, who was a leader of that royal house that uh, led a revolt, an internal you know civil war within this, you know, the Kano Emirates. And they, they moved out with his entire brothers out to what is today Garko, I mean, Take, are mobilized to come and take out then uh, Emir, you know, that was, uh, that was in contest. Now, uh, the, the, the governor's uh, great grand uncle, because uh, Galadima Kano Yusuf died, you know, uh, during that crisis, during that war, mm -hmm. who he would have become the Emir. But then uh, Serki Alu took over, you know, who is his great uncle, 
and became the king. He was taken out by the colonial masters in 1903. Okay? Now, fast forward to the 1950s. You now see the dynamic started changing. Colonial masters have started removing their hands in our affairs. It was the build-up to the independence. And you have the political leaders in the north and south, the likes of Sir Ahmed Bello, the likes of Chief Obafemi Awolowo, War, the likes of Namdi Azikwe, Sir Namdi Azikwe, emerged. And then the power dynamics changed. And then don't forget that hitherto, the Obas and the Obis and the, and the, and the uh, Emirs kings in, in, in northern Nigeria were actually de facto presidents or governors of their regions. And they are here we have a new dynamics with leaders they have to report to. So that initial tussle, you know, for example, Oba Ademi, you know, the Alafin of Oyo, had that issue with uh, Awolo, and he was deposed around 19, 1955. The same, uh, if you like, tsunami <laughs> happened in north between uh, Sir Ahmed Bello and his very good friend, Sir Muhammad Sunusi I, and then later, you know, the latter had to abdicate. So you can go on and on. But what is interesting with the, the latter day politics yes. of today is it is becoming rampant and it's becoming without reason. And the most important part of it is you have what I call insider support within the various royal houses sabotaging their own institutions and becoming tools in the hand of politicians to desecrate their institutions, which to me is not strategic. Because if you go back even 50 years ago, Kano was the biggest, you know, emirate at that time. You know, during the time of late uh, alleged Ado Bayro of blessed memory, when Jiga and Kano were together. Today, Jiga has about 25, 26 local government. Kano has about 44. So if you put it together, you can imagine the expanse of, uh, of one influence. Monarch. Now, it, one monarch. And then now reduced to Kano as it is today, 44 local government. And then now... In his wisdom, Governor Gonduji said he needed to break it into, you know, more whatever. However you may see it, is it increasing the span and the influence and the capacity of the traditional institution to add the values they, have, they should have, spiritual, uh, you know, traditional, cultural, and religious? Or is it waning, you know, as the case may be, across Nigeria? Governor Yahya Bello, at the twilight of his administration, deposed, three, uh, deposed two emirs including the Emir of Koton Karifi, mm. and suspended one. And these are, um, these are traditional stools that have been there for hundreds of years, adding critical value and deposing. Why? For political reasons. And that is why we said early political calculation, which is our topic of discussion. We and and that which, will now, yes, we we will now dimension bit, yeah, we yeah, we'll now, the, absolutely. The, the conversation. We cannot dimension the are, are you seeing, of that. Are you seeing uh, 2027 in what is happening in Kano? Oh, definitely. It goes without saying. One, Kano... I think is the most politically important state with all due respect to other states in Nigeria. There is nobody that is going to become a president of Nigeria that should not be keen and interested on having what I call political value in Kano and having a hole in Kano. Why? Because we are the most popular state in Nigeria. Secondly, we, are the second, we have the second highest number of voters, registered voters in Nigeria, over 6 million voters. Thirdly, it is the commercial hub you know, of northern Nigeria and the gateway to the Sahel. Fourthly, because we are stubborn people, it, it goes without saying that you need to be sure you are going to reign in Kano and get the votes you want. Historically, you know, Kano has always been an anti-establishment, right from the First Republic, during the times of Nehu and all that, when they gave the, the ruling party of MPC of Sir Ahmed Bello headaches. And then we came to Second Republic, where PRP took over mantle of leadership in Kano against the you know, powers of the governors of the, uh, government at the center. The same way, power of incumbency could not return uh, Senator Rabi Musa Konkose in 2003, regardless of all the pressures from the center. So you can go on and on. You saw what happened in 2015. It was a tug of war between uh, the current governor, then candidate, with then incumbent uh, Governor Ganduji. And then you saw what happened in 2023. Now, because of those sensitivities and sensibilities about the political dynamics of Kano and the economic value of Kano and the social value of Kano and its preeminent position in the scheme of things as a gateway to the Sahel, it is important for any politician that is what he saw to be interested in Kano and all the power blocks and power dynamics in Kano. Now, how it is going to be interesting now is 2019, the sign started. And now I'm speaking to like the APC. 
we saw the signs and the trends. It was a very big tug of war for Ganduje as an incumbent to return. Water under the bridge. 2023, we saw, we know the numbers. Abba Kabir became governor, His Excellency, and now President Tinubu, we know, lost at the presidential in Kanu. This is the kind of politics you have a very highly political conscious people, very independent minded people. Albeit now, the dynamics are changing because the royal half of Kanu has clearly polarized the political dynamics of Kanu. You have people that are, you know, uh, loyal and sympathetic to. His Highness Muhammad Sunusi II, and by extension, Senator Konkoso and, and uh, Governor uh, Abba Kabir Yusuf. On the other side, you have people that are sympathetic and also loyal to the other five Emirates, let me put it that way, led by His, his Highness you know, Al -Al Amina Ado Bayeru, and by extension, leaning towards the center, which is uh, APC, led by President Bola Ahmed Tinibu and Ganduji. Now, these dynamics may seem like a one plus one is equal to two for elementary political calculation with due respect. But having gone back to what I said regarding the stubbornness and political consciousness and awareness of, of Kano people and their tenacity of post purpose and courage in the face of whatever will come to stand their ground, that will be an interesting scenario because now we know. For me, as a, as a, as a certified strategist, I will sit down and say, hmm, let me go back to 2023 and look at the numbers. How many numbers did the NMPP bring to the table? How many numbers did Ganduje bring to the table for President Tenobu? And how has he been able to rally the power blocks within the APC post-election and post, you know, uh, I mean, during post-election and then after the inauguration of President Bola Ahab and Tenobu? Are all the power blocks within the APC happy at the moment with regards to how they have been handled in the past one year since President Tinubu came into power, to the extent that the, that power block will remain the same in terms of interest, in terms of pursuing the interest at the center? Or is there a problem? Because if you look at it, the people that have gone to position in power so far are either Mr. Ganduje or his son or who else? The gubernatorial candidate ended up with the chairmanship of the Governance Council of BUK, Bayern University Kano. So when you look at it from that perspective and say, transpose the voting pattern of 2023 in 2027, it presupposes to me that the dynamics of 2023 will play out. But then again, we have socioeconomic vagaries that President Tinubu inherited that he's struggling to get out of. So it appears to me uh, President Tinubu will have to go back to the drawing board to re-strategize with regards to how this key issue of Kano Emirates play out. How it play out is going to impact on the 2027 election. And that is why you see the dramatic person making sure that they are the ones that have the state power at the end of the day for Kanu, you know, specifically. And why so? Uh, the peripheral, for me, uh, if I'm going to sound out and say there's a word of caution, peripheral vision in terms of political calculation in the North, permutation and calculation, permutations and combination is important for the ruling party also, because we don't want to generate a sympathy, you know, in Kano that will become a movement that will permeate into other states, mm -hmm. leaning not just on the issue of Emirates, because that for me is a secondary issue, with due respect. The issue of the Emirates. For me, as a child of traditional the institution, the as a problem? child of Kano, as a child of traditional institution, for me, what is primary is the life and livelihood of citizens of Kano and citizens of Nigeria. The social vagaries, socio-economic vagaries that is impacting, multidimensional. We have the highest number of multidimensionally poor people in Nigeria, Hamza, across northern Nigeria, with the highest in Sokoto, and it is, you know, spreading across. Now, these sentiments are things you cannot remove from the mind of anybody. It is reality everybody is facing. And that is why I was telling somebody the other time, what will be the socioeconomic outcome of whether the five Emirates remain or the consolidated Emirates remain? Will that change the price of Gary in the market? Or will that alleviate the cost of medication in the hospitals? That will not change. But of course, on the face value, it may appear that these traditional rulers also have followership that the sentiments will play to. But let us not forget that we have people that do not really care who is the Emir. Because they are worried that their children are beginning to eat grass. They are worried that they are beginning to eat food that they hitherto they give animals to eat. Is that why we are not seeing 
like um, reaction from the people in Kano. Today, ordinarily, if it were 10 years back, absolutely, uh, Kano will have been in flames. Thank you very much. You see, now that is why I was calling in my right talk to the traditional institution. Mm. They have become willing tools and pawns in a game that they should be the masters. But what can they do, Baba? Well, they, they have already, you see, now we are speaking in past tense, right? We are only talking damage control. And that is the sad you know, story as a child of that institution, that we are born to have foresightedness and long vision to ensure that what happens today, we don't allow politicians to make it happen. Because today, however it plays out, whether it is the unconsolidated Kano or the, or the balkanized Kano, Kano's traditional institution, whether we like it or not, has been to a large extent demystified. But let's come back to the conversation about the 20, 2017, yeah, I mean 2027. Yeah, yes. This is the beginning of the permutations and combinations at the top. But I dare say if we look at the trends of events in Africa and other, nation, other countries around the world, that the sensitivity, the consciousness of the people is changing to the extent that power of incumbency is not really that fashionable anymore. We saw it happen in Kenya. We just saw it happen in, 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 in South Africa. Yeah, we Somebody saw statement by Ramaphosa. Absolutely. That the people were disappointed. Absolutely. In. And that is to tell you that most power of incumbencies in Africa believe in using the power of coercion. But the power of coercion, where it has applied, even in those countries where they are applied recently, did not work. Because you can't push a man that is behind, that his back is against the wall, into the wall. It is, it is either they stand up and take a position that they believe is in their best interest, or they die trying anyway because they are dying every day anyway. So the dynamics of 2027 to those that are playing the politics today, my 10 core advice to them is the variables are changing because the political consciousness of Nigerians are changing. And these vague sentimentalities of royalties will not really make significant impact per se. But the sentiment of it will make, because we are highly sentiment, we love our institution. You can see the followers and adherents of the various, how they are passionate about, how they are coming. And I will tell you to apply to their voting pattern. When to, and you cannot influence that. And like I said, let us go back. It's just like Lagos. President Tibu knows how Lagos is. They are very political aware. You cannot push them. You can, it's just like Edo State. Now, these trends are coming. And I advise the political, especially I'm talking about the power in the center now because they are the ones in the eyes of the storm. First of all, they have a mandate to deliver. They don't want to be distracted with what I call, at that level, micro issues. Because as far as I'm concerned, we do respect. The Kano Emirates issue is a micro issue. As far as I'm concerned, we have bigger issues that we are dealing with. But for this year, if government does not take drastic action, we are going to have bigger issues. Now, juxtapose that to the reality we are going to face as we approach 2027, with the issue going on in rivers. Which right. we are going to actually so, 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 so for me, yes, the die is cast, but people should not think it's going to be the normal one plus one is equal to two. It's going to be with new, new dimensions. And I believe with due respect to their political sagacity, they are making the early move to test the waters and they have time to backtrack where there are mistakes to be made. So but who will actually save the monarchies in Nigeria? Well... For me, I also hazard in various fora in the past three weeks, speaking to all stakeholders within the institution and outside the institution, that one thing we should remember for all of us that are not politically inclined to the extent that we blind our eyes to our realities is every one of us comes from somewhere, Hamza. We all identify with somewhere. And one of the remnants of institutions we have that the colonial master left for us whether it is good or bad, is the traditional institution. And they still maintain theirs when you go to the Europe. And that is what we identify with. I did not see them balkanizing or bringing issue with it in UK, for example. I don't see it happening in Thailand, for example. All right? That being said also, it is time for the traditional institution, the traditional rulers also to have an, a, 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 an introspection. Because to be honest... The mentality, the, 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 the sense of entitlement mentality of the traditional rulers is what brought them to where they are today. How do you mean? Thank you very much. We, that are children of traditional institution, move around with this air of arrogance and entitlement that it is we and it is them. And that is why triggered 
the progressive elements like Mala Amin Kano of Blessed Memory and uh, Mrs. Fumulai or Ransom Kuti of Blessed Memory to stand up against the traditional institution at that border between colonialist living and uh, independence. And that is why you have revolts against the Alake of Abaland by Fumilai Ranks of Kuti and her group, and then Mala Amin Kanu also taking up the institution, and you can see how that pressure led to the junta around 1966-67, promulgating and bringing a law that cornered basically royal houses or traditional institutions to local government level. Now, they have not woken, we have not woken to that reality, to say the law for our people, our integrity, you know, sticking to our core values, are remaining as much as possible. Elders and neutral, at least frontally, politically, is what has led them to this level. And then of issues of materialism, where you see traditional leaders kowtowing to these governors and to the extent that they lose their dignity and respect. And that is what is brought this issue of polarization of the house. A lack of vision to say, I will have the waiting game or I will play over and beyond that to look at the institution, not what is my interest. Okay, so that is what has happened to the tra It's happening, not has happened. I gave you instances elsewhere. Yeah, it's not just Kano. Yeah. And it is coming to other places as well. Sitting pretty and having photo ops with your al kabba you know, and your sword and just doing Photoshop is not what is going to sustain the traditional institution. Even fairness, oh, they are just trying to be neutral. Of course, we saw a statement mm. or two mm. from the umbrella body of mm. our traditional rulers yeah. in respect to uh, the Kano incident. But mm. do you think that it, what they said is so loud to have said that, look, we still have this institution and we have to protect it? They have I don't want to call names of... No, I know the bodies you are talking about. Even those ones have become political. They are talking to us. Leaning. What I want to see is a body or people that will come and be neutral. Even in Kano, with due respect to our elders, I wanted to see a group of people that will not be leaning toward Muhammad Sunusi II or this. They are like children to them. Or they are their mates. Ordinary, you should have been clerics. But we saw two groups. Clerics, as far as I'm concerned, is a conversation we should have another day. Because they are also part of the problem. Because we have not been able to have those sounding boards within the society that will I, go, even if it is quietly, to speak to these people. The more the number, the merrier, because the, we have the few ones that do that, but they will not make the impact, right? Now, the traditional institutions are beginning to feel it now, to say whether you speak out for your people or not, you are a political tool, period. So you better die or you better go down as somebody that start, they stood for core values, like the Alume Sangos and others, or you just sit down there and sit pretty and you'll be eased out. And in the next couple of years, those traditional institutions will just be like museums. Because the people are beginning to lose the confidence that you as a traditional leader will speak for us in the eyes of the stop, in troubled time, that you can support us. You know, like the late Alej Ado Bayro, our father of blessed memory, may God, you know, bless his soul. Mm -hmm. Like late uh, Emir Sanusi, His Highness Khalifa Sanusi the first. May God bless you. So these were people that were going out, doing things for the people that you can see, building schools, you know, supporting hospitals, and speaking to government and doing strategic engagement for the people. Now that is changing. The, the traditional institutions are becoming more or less decorative and more or less going with the flow. I'm not saying they, sh they should take up any government in a combatant way or speak to them in a manner that is not right. But they hold that charisma and reverence to the extent that they can engage government, speak true to power, and come back and ensure as subnational, as federal, the people that they are, you know, overseeing are feeling their impact. And that is why recently, you know what happened in Sokoto about two, three years ago, very sordid situation where I see people stoning, you know, the house of Sultan. This, has, this is not politically engineered, which is people are now beginning to speak out in a way. To say, what are you doing? Hey, come on, what are you doing? You are here, what are you doing for us? You know, and that is the consciousness that I want the traditional rulers to take. And all the people that have anything to do with traditional institutions. It is only when that institution thrives that you can go out there and, uh, you know, go with that haughtiness that you are of royalty. All right, of now what value is you, if your royalty if it does not impact on your people? So legislation is one of them. Critical stakeholder engagement is one of them. To see how we can come with a governance framework to say how do we preserve 
to the extent that except A, B, C happens, we shouldn't have these depositions all over the place. I and maybe hope, take I one hope the National from Assembly the will, will, will discuss that we, since they are actually trying to revisit the constitutional, constitutional review. When we get there, which I hope time will permit us, mm. um, don't you think government houses are also becoming decorated in a way? Mm. Governors are completely distracted. Now, take Kanu again, for instance. Take mm. Rivers. Mm. Just today, yes. Governor Kubara <laughs> telling local government chairman, you know, caretaker, to operate from anywhere. I mean, yes. that even from Abuja, they can sign checks yes. to, 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 to withdraw monies and yes. all that. Look at in Kaduna. You know, the, <coughs> Wasani has not yet settled. Yes. The, the rancor between him and his predecessor is obvious. Of course, Konko so very at peace with, you know, Abba Yusuf, but then he took over from another person yes. who is now old. fighting him. Yes. Is it not too early to start having these problems? You know, I consider it a phase in our political evolution, Hamza. You have already narrated a trend, which is in the early is happening at the period of the tenure of President Tinubu. This trend is becoming more pronounced. It has been there before. And that is going to test the political dexterity of President Tinubu, whether or not that state is APC or not. When governors are distracted from delivering their mandate, you know, with due respect to Mr. President, the input of the governors is his output. Forget about the principle of separation of powers. That this is national, this is the general. The general consciousness mm -hmm. is if we are not eating, it's Tinubu. If I go to hospital, I don't get medication, it's Tinubu. And these governors are already, everybody could see the side kind of interventions or kind of interferences that are coming from the center, which they could use as excuse for not delivering. While I know, I have said in many fora, the governors of Nigeria have been responsible for the 65% failure of Nigeria. They have been serially and successively failing Nigerians. Somebody but suggested that we should scrap states with the why power should local we, government. But why should we have at the center now a situation whereby you are inadvertently giving excuses for people not to deliver? You mentioned Fubara. What do you want uh, Fubara to do? We know where the issues for Fubara is coming from. And Fubara cannot sit down. If Fubara sit down, they are going to basically mow him or bulldoze him out of that place. What is happening in, in, in Irivoz is regrettable. It shouldn't be happening. So you, you think that the way he's fighting back is justified? You see, when you push somebody to the wall, remember what I told you before, he has to react. And the law of motion, I, the third law of motion, Isaac Newton, for every action there, should, there is going to be a reaction. It is very clear that if he doesn't make a counter move, by now he would have gone. Whether his counter moves will make him to survive to 2007 is another conversation. But every day, the ruling party, that is President Tinubu, who is not, you know, it, it, Fubara is, in, not, is, is in, his, in his party, is becoming unpopular because they are claiming that he is the one that is supporting Wiki, that is pushing Fubara to refuse to deliver for them. So every day, they are gaining more popularity. Because I remember a proverb, there is a, there is a proverb from the people of Rivers, that one person, hmm, can cook as much food as that person can cook, and visitors will finish it. But there is nobody that can finish the food that a group of people cook. So what they are saying is, if all the people of Rivers now start feeling this way, it will get to a point, there is no how you can come tomorrow and say, give me your votes. You get what I'm saying? Mm. You talk about Kaduna, Kaduna issues of... Uh, and that's what I wanted to say, because if Rivers, mm -hmm. there was provocation yes. in Rivers. Yes. Uh -huh. Was there a provocation in Kaduna? Well, Kaduna is the typical issue of a uh, textbook issue of Nigerian godfatherism politics going on. And I believe also the governor is raising the issue quickly against 2027 because obviously he knows he may not be able to deliver the way he's expected to deliver. Why? Well, you see, it goes back to the fundamental issue of recruitment. The recruitment process. process. Right? Yes, I agree. There are issues that the former governor needs to answer because I have also issues with governors coming to pile up debt, which is also a trend in Nigeria. And then people will say they didn't see tangible or intangible values. I would like to see people coming to do PowerPoint to tell us this is where the money came, this is what you got. That is what this particular issue of Koduno will bring about. But over and beyond that, Hamza, we are all leaders in our own rights. I rose in the corporate ladder to the highest level of chief executive 
MDCO. I'm running an organization in Nigeria. I own a company in another country. The point is this. When you inherit leadership, you inherit the capital and the liability. You know this is what you have taken so apart. And it's not typical with state government, even at the federal. When President Buhari came, he didn't even, Jonathan was responsible for even his failure for eight years. Now we are seeing the trends at federal and uh, subnational. So these issues of distractions, I believe, are creating diversionary. Like in the case of Rico, like I'm saying, the president is making it easy for the governor mm -hmm. to have a free ride to the government house in 2027. Because I, I believe President Tinubu is a, is a Democrat. He fought for democracy in Nigeria. We celebrated it some days ago. We heard what he has done for democracy. I don't think at his age today, what he has achieved, Tinubu will become a political demagogue and become a dictator. But many people believe, uh, assuming that we actually overrated him, going no. by the way things uh, are falling Well, this apart. is now for him to prove that he was not overrated. Performance is not measured by events. Performance is measured by results. Now, for the governors, excuses also. Performance is not measured by events. Performance is measured by results. It is your job to remain focused or to be distracted by whatever. And in strategy, we know you pick your battles. I can decide today what are my priorities as a governor of Kanu, as a governor of Rivers, as a governor of Kaduna. What are my priorities? So can you search for them? We have less than uh, three minutes to go. Yes, I, and I want, because we keep lamenting. You yes. can see now we're lamenting. And yes. every other station, whoever you bring, is about lamentation. C can we set a target for them now? Maybe the governors ahead of the 2027, Forget about the politics. People are dying, malnutrition, and all that. What do you think each and every governor should do so that people will have the impact to believe in democracy? Because people are asking whether democracy is actually the way to go. Or we need an entirely, not military, but an entirely different concept in order to give sense of belonging to the citizens. I'll answer these two questions real quick. Which in two minutes, yeah. Yes, for me, everywhere I go, I talk about the issues, I talk about the solutions, I will still talk about the same solution I offer everybody. All right. What is lacking at federal and subnational levels is that people actually know in their heads what they want to do with due respect to them. But they take things for granted to the extent that they don't craft well thought out strategic blueprint depending on their individual priorities at the states. Now, certain priorities for states will just be wrong because every state should have its priority. But what I know, there are three critical issues. There is issue of insecurity, which affects every other thing, federal and state level. So they I should saw address it. I still, a lot of movement without motion by state governors in Nigeria, especially northern Nigeria, to address that. If you don't address that, your years will be wasted. Secondly, do you have a socioeconomic blueprint? How are you dealing with the issues of production? The three critical values of a leader is value creation, value innovation, and value protection. We have mineral resources. We have arable lands. We have human capital. How are you even to rail them to generate wealth? What happened to the revenue you are collecting? Have you been adequately applying it to health, to education? Now, the rains have come. We have been telling them farmers will not be able to go to farm. And because of global warming, production will be less. How are they heading towards that? But when you have a strategy to address these critical sectors, you can measure every six months and do an assessment to say, this is how I'm impacting, depending on my priorities. They don't have a strategy. They just want to go to the office. After they get to the office, they start crying. There is debt. There is problem. There is insecurity. It's an admittance of failure, Hamza. All right. All right. I wish they get it right here, Baba Yusuf. Thank and you. I wish we have more time yes, to chew this uh, existential Crisis. Problem with you more, yeah. But we, of course, we thank you very much for coming to the program. Thank and we you for having you some other time. Anytime, of course, viewers. We've been chatting with uh, Baba Yusuf, he's a policy analyst and the group CEO of Global Investment and Trade Company, which was Kano Rivers and all that. We hope you found the conversation engaging and informative. And be sure to join Daily Politics live airing every weekday on our special package on Friday during which we open our telephone line for you to comment on national issues. Tomorrow will be your day. Get set, call on time, and share your thoughts on the topic we will arrive at. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye for now. I'm Hamza Idris.